Thanks for coming on a Friday afternoon at lunchtime, maybe for most of you, it could be earlier in the day for others. Um, I'm Debbie Schwartz, founder of Road to College and the Paying for College 101 group. Um, we um, have done this pop-up of uh, merit scholarships um, a few times, and as it's the season, right, that people should be um, building the college list, we'll probably do it more frequently. Um, so I appreciate you being here. Um, and this is recorded if you have to jump off and we send the recording. Today's Friday, so probably um, probably Sunday. Um, and I'd love to know who's here. If uh, you guys want to tell me where you're watching from, what year your child is in school. I assume a lot of people here have students who are rising seniors. Um, sometimes people with younger kids uh, pop on to, to start to learn earlier. And I'd also really like to know, um, have you started? Like, where are you on the process? Have you gone to some college visits? Have you start building a list? Have you done any research? And if you haven't done anything, tell me that too. That is okay. Um, <laughs> um, you still, this is still, we're in June, we're even toward though we're getting to the end of June. So you're still in an okay position to, to get started if you haven't started. So um, let's see, while you do that, I'm gonna pull up my screen. Um, so I can just get my slides going. And great, let's see. Oh, and the last thing. Um, is uh, I run these as webinars, I'm sorry, I run these as meetings and not webinars, just because if you're willing to be on video, I appreciate it, I like to see faces. And then the other thing is, um, we're not a huge group today, believe it or not, sometimes I do this and we have like a, like a, a few hundred people, which, so this is a nice size. If you want to unmute yourself and ask a question instead of typing it into chat, um, I'm fine with that too. So let's see where people are from. So Florida, Texas, Virginia. Um, let's see, parent of a rising senior. I have a list of 16 schools. That's pretty good. Um, uh, me and my daughter are rising senior on Long Island, New York. We have a built list, but always adding to it. That's a really you know, good point. This is an iterative process. I mean, you might think you know, you're done, maybe um, Kimberly with your 16 schools, you think maybe, you know, it's close and you will find that um, even, you know, as your student starts to do applications, some schools come off, some schools come on it, until the very end. Um, I'm just chuckling. I'm thinking back to a story of actually one of our college counselors who I work, who I partner with, um, and she's, this is her business all year long. Um, her student applied early decision to a school. They had their list of backups. Her student didn't get in early decision. And it was the beginning of December. And they like kind of added all these new schools. So, you know, that's just the nature of, of what happens because as you go further along, um, you learn more about the process. You learn more about, um, you know, your student learns more about themselves. They learn more and you learn more about what you're looking for in a school. And so um, and one of the things I'm gonna mention when I do the presentation is this building the college list, right? Is all about making sure you and your student have options, right? So you wanna have financial options and they wanna have, you know, options of where, they're, where they've gotten in um, or the places that they really wanna go. So that's why, um, you know, again, it's iterative and that's why you might, you know, uh, further along in the process say, hey, you know what, let's just add this school because we, um, you know, we're, you know, now we know more about what we're looking for and um, we want to just have it as an option uh, to be able to maybe put it as part of the discussion come next spring when you have, you know, all of the results laid out. So anyhow, I got a little off topic, but thanks for sharing that, that, you know, um, you're always going to be adding to the list. Okay, I'm going to jump over to start my screen, share my screen. And Okay, can somebody just like put thumbs up? Are you seeing where it says, you know, building a college list, road to college? Thank you. Um, let me open chat so I can see. So um, 
let me just say, put in your questions into chat because this is the middle of the day. I'm trying to gonna get through this by one o'clock. Um, I may not be, I'll try and glance at questions as I'm going through, but um, if I don't answer all the questions, I'll usually go through the questions um, after. And um, if there's like major topics, um, I'll send it in the follow-up email with um, some uh, more information, you know, if I didn't answer the question uh, right now. Okay, so we're here today to talk about building a list. And we honestly, my focus has always been, and I think you can tell me wrong if um, the people who are here, we want to build a list that um, your student can't get into. And quite honestly, you can afford. And um, saying that you can afford it could be that maybe you can afford it outright because you found the right school at the right you know, price. But it also might be that you need to find the school that's going to offer your student the most money so that it um, so that the net cost after whatever money that the school can offer is, is something you can afford. So that's why, even though it's about building a college list, we are talking about really, to some extent, how you're gonna pay for college. Uh, and really the three buckets of where money comes from college are whatever money you might've uh, accumulated or saved from family contributions. Uh, and then there's free money. And then ultimately, if you don't get enough free money, um, you need to borrow money, right? So we're focusing in that middle tier of the free money and free money comes from need-based financial aid, which you might be, your family might be in that situation. And we'll talk about how you can figure that out. Merit scholarships, which majority of people, that's what they're really looking for. The school that is going to offer their student the most merit scholarships. And we're going to talk about what merit scholarships are. And then there's private scholarships and then government grants. Government grants are for uh, families, you know, on the lower um, income spectrum. And private scholarships, although there's a lot of um, hoopla about it. That's what I'd say. I kind I, I don't, I don't, um, say don't do them, but I say it's, it's really, in my opinion, um, a source of last resort because it takes a lot of effort to go after private scholarships. It is not, um, that you won't get money there. It's just, that you have to put a lot more effort, um, in, in going through that process. And so if I compare merit scholarships versus private scholarships, the amount of effort that you need to do for your student to find the right school with the merit scholarships is a lot less, and you will get more money from, from um, finding the right schools. So that's, again, why we focus on that. Okay, so Michelle, you're asking, is there a list that shows how to get in-state per state? Maybe if you can describe that a little bit more, I'm not quite sure what you mean by in-state per state, unless you're talking about um, where you can get in-state tuition uh, from another a pile list versus trying to chase it down per school or per state. A, a compiled list of what? Of the schools that can offer your student in state tuition and you're an out of state student? Of the requirements for in state tuition per state. Oh, um, no, because that is usually actually school by school defines um, oh, what. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What, what I thought it was the state level. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, why are we focusing on the college list? Because um, the college list drives everything, right? The colleges on your list are where, or what is going to determine your family's final cost of college. The colleges on your students' list are obviously the schools where um, they will hopefully be accepted. You can't get accepted to a school that's not on the list and that your student doesn't apply to. But also the college list also determines how much work your student's going to have to do. I'm not getting involved in, in um, discussion of essays today, but if you've come to any of the sessions that we have, we partner with a company called Prompt. Um, they talk about you know, the work that's needed to go into uh, writing essays. And in addition to the Common App essay, which every student's gonna need to write because that applies to all the schools, really where the work, the extra work comes in to for essays as it relates to your student's college list is, Colleges have a lot of supplemental, or some colleges have supplemental essays, and those supplemental essays can start to add up. So depending on the number of schools your student is applying to, that's going to impact the number of supplemental essays they're going to have to write. So, you know, so the college list is driving costs, admissibility, and workload. Um, and the last comment is a phrase we like to say, Student, you can't get money from a college that you don't apply to. So again, this relates to how important the college list is. To me, the college list is the defining factor, right? Um, so if you haven't done the research before creating that college list, and, um, and I'll tell you a story a little later on, 
Um, you can't get, there might be schools out there that give a lot of money, but if your student didn't, if your student didn't apply to them, obviously they're not going to get money from those schools. So that's why it's so important to really um, research and understand what schools your student is applying to for all the reasons I just mentioned, you know, cost, um, where they can definitely, you know, whether they have the highest chances of getting in and, and the workload it's going to take to go through the process. So let's now focus on um, merit aid. Uh, a lot of people, there's a lot of different names for merit aid. Uh, it's called merit aid. It's called merit scholarships. A lot of times now it's just called also tuition discount. And to some extent in its raw, rawest form, if I'm saying that correctly, R-A-W-E-S-T, um, that uh, it is a discount, right? It's the colleges say, this is my um, um, sticker price. My sticker price is what the cost of attendance is and I'm gonna publicize that. But for some students, I'm willing to give them a scholarship, which, going, which in essence is going to discount that sticker price and bring it down to a, a net price. And um, one thing I kind of want to emphasize, you know, uh, related to this whole process is that if you that colleges are businesses and we should never lose sight of that. Um, I think sometimes we do because we have this feeling that they're in academia. It's like they're, they, they work in a different um, world. They're focused on teaching. They, you know, it's, it's, they have these beautiful campuses. We don't think of them in the same sense of what we think of a business, but they are businesses, right? So um, the colleges have a certain amount of money that they might be giving out. They have to decide, am I gonna give that money out to families with financial need? Or am I going to give that money out to students who I want to attract to my institution for lots of different reasons? I might want to attract them because it's going to um, raise our academic um, uh, you know, profile. I might want to attract certain students because they have talents um, and I want to build up uh, maybe, um, you know, a, an engineering um, school, or I want, um, or maybe I'm, uh, as, a, as, a, as a college, I'm deciding to focus on environmental studies. So you might want to attract certain students um, based on, you know, what their interests are and what their talents are. Um, and really, you know, a college um, uh, is making those decisions, and we're trying to figure out what, what, how they're using their money and they're not always transparent about it. And, you know, although we want them to be transparent, again, it's think about it as a business. They don't have to tell us how they're going to use their money, but we're going to try and figure it out by looking at some of the past history of how they've done it, in, it before. So the other thing about uh, merit aid or merit scholarships is that it is renewable. And actually that goes back to my comment about private scholarships. Most private scholarships are a one-time offer. Um, and so if you, your student is going after private scholarships, they have to send, do applications every year. So that's a uh, you know, downside of private scholarships. Um, so if your student gets a merit scholarship as an incoming freshman, they will likely have it for four years as long as they meet the requirements. And that's the third bullet point is that um, the merit scholarships mostly have some sort of GPA requirement and it can range. I would say the majority of them are pretty lenient, the GPA requirements. They want the student to continue to get the merit scholarship money and they're probably uh, a GPA requirement about 3.30, but sometimes they are higher. Um, and so when you get to the point where your student it is uh, accepted and they're offered a merit scholarship, you're going to really want to look at those requirements and make sure that you and your student feel comfortable that they can meet those requirements for all four years. The worst situation would be that, that you and your student chose a school because it was affordable, but it was affordable based on the fact that your student was getting merit scholarships. And then somewhere along the line, sophomore, junior year, they don't meet the GPA requirements. So um, that's something we're going to focus on in the spring, but I'm just planting that idea now that you want to ultimately make sure that whatever school your student chooses and they're getting merit scholarships, that they're going to be able to continue to get the money for four years. Okay, and the last bullet point, which is in the environment that we're in right now with um, inflation and, and rising interest rates, is um, merit scholarships don't usually increase with tuition every year. So whatever is offered um, in going into freshman year, let's just say it's a $20,000 merit scholarship, that $20,000 is gonna be offered every year, but in tuition is going to increase. Um, and so I just bring that 
point up because, um, and it's another session that we can do about how you forecast your costs, which you absolutely should do. You should be looking at costs for the four years, not just for one year. Um, when you're doing you know, a cost analysis of what it, the college is, what it, it's gonna cost you for to send your student to the college for four years, you're gonna factor in the merit scholarships, but they're gonna be flat and you're gonna um, factor in an increase for the tuition. It's just something to keep in mind. So um, I like to give people a little bit of background on the college side, right? About um, what's happening um, when, when they're going through admissions um, so that you have a better idea of just the whole process in general. Um, and the reason why I would talk about what's happening on the college side is because um, you, again, I'm kind of coming back to this concept that, that colleges are a business and I know it feels so personal, particularly to your student, if they didn't get in, you know, why they didn't get in, and, and it might be a reflection on them. And it really is not a reflection on them and what their capabilities are. It's really a reflection on um, that the colleges have certain priorities, they have a certain amount of seats, and a lot of colleges these days um, probably have, I don't know an exact number, but they the number of students who apply who are capable and what I would call admissible is way more than the college can accept. So there's a difference between whether your student is admissible and whether they are going to be accepted. And most students who apply, if they're applying to the right schools, they are admissible. And that means that, that they have the right criteria, they could be successful at that school. Um, and the fact that they're not accepted doesn't mean that they're still stats weren't good, or there's something wrong with, with them as a student. Um, it really just means that the priorities that the college had um, couldn't accommodate your student, and they were potentially looking for a different set of, of criteria to meet their priorities. So um, I, you know, I want you to pass that on to your student when it comes down to, I don't really want, they shouldn't feel like they were rejected. It's just that um, you know, the colleges had different priorities, and that's why they weren't potentially accepted. But if you look at what the colleges are doing, it's really in the um, what they call enrollment management, right? And so they are trying to strategically use their resources to figure out how to meet their revenue and enrollment goals. That's really the basic um, concept. They've got money. Um, they're in some ways the admissions office is some, kind of like the marketing department. They're trying to you know attract and acquire new students, and they have to hit certain amount of revenue and certain amount of enrollment. Um, numbers and they're using whatever money they have to do that by offering need-based aid or merit scholarships. Um, and then here's just, uh, and actually the other slide that I just um, got off of quickly shows you that colleges work with um, consultants and these consultants, and there's usually, there's actually just a few big ones. These consultants are working with colleges to come up with models. So that's another thing that sometimes not all of these decisions are really personal decisions about your student. They might, they're just kind of, for some schools, particularly the bigger state schools, and even um, that they're they're based on a model that that um, a college has, has created. And if you look at the quote that I have here, this is from an, a consultant trying to um, market to a college. And they're saying, you always need to have have awarding strategies that address need and willingness to pay. So doing this successfully means that you have to understand the price sensitivity of various student populations you hope to recruit. And, um, and so colleges are street thinking strategically about, well, I want to attract a certain student, maybe with a certain academic profile, but that family also has a price sensitivity. So how much am I going to have to offer that student in a merit scholarship to get them to accept my offer. And that's the modeling that goes on. Um, and so, and this is, you know, uh, uh, just a, a slide that, that, the, that, the, that the colleges use to kind of show you all the different factors that go into the decision. So there's your student factors in the first column. Um, then there's just, you know, environmental factors. And, um, you know, part of the environmental factors are, are demographic trends. So um, um, what's happening about where students are located? There's actually a trend that um, the number of 18 year olds is decreasing in like in the Northeast, Northeast, but it's increasing in the Southwest. So colleges have been slowly shifting where they're recruiting students from um, because they're going after where the population of uh, 18 year olds are. Um, 
So just again, keep this all in mind. There are a lot of factors going into the admission decision of whether your student is accepted. It doesn't mean that your student isn't admissible and it doesn't mean that they wouldn't be successful if they had the chance to go to a college. So there are three types of merit aid. Um, the three buckets are automatic, competitive, and talent. And I don't, these are actually buckets that we created. I don't think that necessarily, I mean, colleges don't necessarily have this language, but it's a, just a way that um, is easy for families to understand the type of merit scholarship that they um, might be going after. Automatic means that um, your student puts in an application and they don't have to do anything else to be um, reviewed for um, or eligible for merit scholarships. It usually in the colleges that provide automatic merit scholarships have grids, and I'm going to show you an example on their websites. They'll have charts and they will say, you know, if your student um, is in this range, they will automatically get, you know, this range of merit scholarship money. So we kind of like these colleges because they are probably, they are the most transparent. They put it out there about um, what you need to have to get what's a certain type of money. Um, and I'll show you an example of that. Competitive merit aid, the reason why I point this out is that these schools have deadlines um, to, uh, that students need to apply to be reviewed for the school's um, merit scholarships. So the important thing to know is that there are deadlines and those deadlines in a lot of cases are different than the deadlines for just regular applications. The, there is sometimes a separate application process, which also may have a separate essay in, or essays involved. So that's why it's important to know the distinction between schools that you don't need to do anything, your student doesn't need to do anything, they just need to apply and they'll be um, reviewed for, for merit versus a school where they might need to do extra to be um, eligible uh, for, for merit. And then the last is if your student you know, might have a special talent and the school um, is giving money out for giving merit at money out for that talent. So, you know, it's usually in like the arts, the music, dancing theater. And again, with that type of money, um, there tends to be deadlines because the deadlines are related to um, auditions or when a portfolio is due. Um, and so again, it's really important to understand what type of money they're going after, what the school's process is and what um, the deadlines uh, associated with that process might be. So um, Sarika is asking, do I have a list of schools that have merit aid charts on their website? I don't. We should probably start compiling that. Um, it tends to be the larger um, state schools that are offering good merit to attract out-of-state students, like um, University of Alabama is a really well-known one um, that, that shows their merit, but um, I don't have one off the bat right now, but uh, it's a good project and we'll start compiling one. So the, the same thing, um, Raina's asking, how do you search which schools have um, automatic aid? Uh, we don't have um, you know, uh, that type of information about whether it's automatic. What you'll see when I show you how to search for merit is you'll, you'll see which schools are offering merit and you're gonna have to go to their website. And by going to the website, we actually have a link directly to the page where they have their merit. You'll be able to quickly see whether it's automatic or not. So where does sports come uh, play getting into aid? I'm gonna, sports has nothing to do with merit. Well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, well, sports, Scholarships are a different bucket than merit um, aid. The only overlap with sports is um, for D3 schools because D3 schools aren't giving athletic scholarships. So if you're an athlete and you wanna get money um, at a D3 school, it, you can get money um, through a merit scholarship and the college might um, uh, put aside merit scholarship money for athletes, but that's at, at um, D3 schools. Okay. So here's an example of the of one of the charts that you might see for automatic merit. And I just show um, three, this is the same school in Miami University. I happen to be um, you know, updating this presentation and I uh, keep adding um, the different charts that were out there for three different years, which you wouldn't see actually if you went to Miami University right now, because they only show, are showing you the chart for 20, um, 2022. So it's kind of interesting that we can look at, um, you know, 2020 and 2021 to see how this chart has changed. So on the far right is the chart when it was 2020, which was right before, this is the fall of 2020. It was right before um, 
or sorry, this was um, probably fall of 2019 and it was before obviously the pandemic. So that's why you see the chart includes um, test scores, ACT and SATs and GPA. So at that time, like a you know, much smaller number of, of schools were test optional. And a lot of schools did require um, students to have a test score and use their GPA. And they were using that information to give out scholarship money. Then you can see on the top right, fall of 2021, um, things changed. And um, that year, a lot, a lot of schools, majority of the schools went test optional. And so they changed this chart to only focus on GPA. Um, and then what you see, if we look at the chart for fall of 2022, is that the weighted GPA numbers changed. So the ranges of which um, the college, this Miami University, was willing to give money to was shifting. And that actually relates back to the concept that the, uh, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I can pretty well say, I feel certain that Miami University was probably working with consultants who were modeling and saying, if we want a student with this type of a GPA, we're going to have to offer them, you know, this type of money. And you can see that they want, they're starting to get, that they wanted students with higher GPAs for the same amount of money that they gave the year before. Um, so, you know, for all the schools, we don't have the privilege of seeing this trend, but um, it's just um, interesting to, to look at. But I will say, if anybody is on here who has a rising junior, um, that's the value of starting your research early, is you can start to identify some schools that your student might be interested in, particularly from a merit scholarship standpoint, and look at what they're giving this year, if they have a chart of like this. And I would um, bookmark it. I would save a copy of it. There was actually a parent in the Paying for College 101 group that did that with Stockton University. And they did it for three years. And they immediately saw, unfortunately, last year that when their student was applying that that, that Stockton had had um, dramatically changed with the merit scholarships that they were willing to offer. There's not much you can do, um, you know, once you see the information, but it just might be interesting to kind of see whether or not the school is giving out more merit than they used to or less. And part of that might be, you know, dependent on the um, economic environment we're in. It could be whether or not they've hit their enrollments, um, but it just might be an interesting um, exercise if you have the time. Okay, here's an example of competitive merit scholarship schools. Um, the, a pretty well-known example is University of, of um, Southern California, USC. They um, do not, they, they're, application deadline for regular decision um, is January 1st, but if your student wants to apply to any merit scholarships at USC, they have to get their application in by December 1st. So that's a big, that's a month difference. Even if your student was, um, had the, the caliber, was eligible for a merit scholarship and they applied after December 1st, they would be out of luck. So this is why it's so important to know what the deadlines are. Okay, here's the story. This is a true story. This is like word for word taken from um, a family in the Paying for College 101 group. And um, I'm going to read the story and tell you why I wanted to show um, this particular um, situation. So my family only got my sorry, my son only got into two schools. He applied to six schools and four of them were reaches. He got waitlisted at all four of those private schools. Of the two schools he got accepted to, only one is a real option because it is affordable. Now he's saying that he thinks that he picked the wrong school and that he should have cast a wider net. And he's very remorseful of all the decisions he made. He wants to go to his second choice school that he got accepted into. The problem is that school has an $82,000 price tag. We did not qualify for any aid. So to me, what this story shows is a few things. One is, um, I didn't. I didn't know this family before this, they shared the story. I didn't. I didn't know this, the students' um, school list, but it doesn't sound like it was balanced, right? It sounded like they applied. To, the, the student applied to six schools. Four of them were real reaches, um, and and he got waitlisted at those. It's okay to apply to reach schools as long as you have enough other schools on the list where you know your student has 
a, you know, in, in this crazy climate of college admissions these days, we can't say with any certainty that any student can into, to get into a, certain, a specific school, even if they have the best, you know, best stats. And, you know, we, I just, it would be foolish for me to say, oh yeah, they can definitely get in because it's just such craziness. But we want to feel like with a high level of certainty that there's a good likelihood that the student can get into um, a a chunk of schools that are going to be on your, your student's college list. So in this case, um, majority of these schools, there was very little certainty that it was, they were really, it sounded like they were um, reach schools. My guess is they were probably um, a lot of elite schools. And, you know, to some extent, those are, I don't want to say the word lottery, but they kind of are, you just, you just do not know what's going to happen. So you can't um, rely on any, uh, estimation of results. So that's the problem that happened here. And then of the two schools, which they probably he had a much better chance of getting into, only one was financially realistic. So when I talked at the beginning that you want to build a list where you have options, this family didn't build the list with options. There were not enough options of really um, schools on that student's list where they had a good chance of getting accepted and there weren't enough options on that family's list where they could afford. Um, and so what, I mean, you, you can say, okay, well, at least they had one school and there is, you know, and I don't really know the outcome of this uh, story. I'm assuming that the student had to go to the school that, that was their number two choice because that was the one that was affordable, but um, they really were kind of backed into a corner. They only had one choice. You want to be in the situation where next spring, when your student has all their, their, all their information back from colleges, where they've been accepted, where they haven't been, what their money is, that you have choices that, that you know, you can have at least two or three um, schools that they got in, that, that the school is affordable, maybe it's affordable because just their sticker price is affordable to you, or maybe it's affordable because they got enough money to make it affordable, um, and your student wants to go to that school. So um, that's what I mean by having options. Uh, weird school bingo is what I've heard the acceptance process these days. Yeah, that's a that's a good way of saying it. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a school bingo, particularly at the elite schools and particularly at schools with you know acceptance or admission rates of like twenty percent or lower. Okay, so um, I'm gonna. Actually, let me jump to the next page. But the only thing I want to say about this is I'm trying to prime you as you work with um, your student to build the college list that, you know, there's a certain attitude you should go into the process. You should know what you can control and what you can't control. And so what I'm talking about today, you control the college list, right? You can't control the college's um, uh, priorities of what they're looking for, but you can control what, where you just, where you and your student decide to, that they should apply. And here's the ping pong game that happens. Um, you, you're in control now, right? You can decide where you want to visit. You can um, decide what questions you want to ask the um, colleges. You can decide how much research and effort you wanted to put into it. And that goes into um, your student can decide how much effort they want to put into writing the essays. This is all within your control. That final college list where your student applies is your control. Once the deadlines happen and you know your student has applied, now the control flips back to the college. They are in control. They are going to look at you know your student's application. They're going to look at it relative to every all, all the other applications that are, going to, that are coming in. They're going to look at it relative to how much money they need to spend or had they have to spend what the what the um, school uh, priorities are. And then they are in control to make the decision. Once the decision is made, the control comes back to you and your um, student because now you have hopefully more than one school that your student's been accepted to. Maybe they have three or four or six or seven, and that's not unrealistic if you do this process well. Um, and so now your student can only go to one school. So now it's your and your student's decision. You're in control about where you're going to be accept, where, where, who you're going to accept so that your student um, decides to enroll in. So that's the, the ping pong back and forth. Okay, let me go through my tips about how to build a college list. And then we're going to flip to College Insights, the tool that we have to help um, people um, really jumpstart a lot of the research. And um, the col these college tips are just, you know, things that we've put together over the years of working with families to create lists. Um, these are kind of universal, whether you decide to use the tool that we have, whether you decide to do your research on your own, these, you know, tips apply. The number first tip is know your EFC, your expected family contribution. I love to hear in the chat 
how, who knows? You don't have to tell me the number. Who knows their EFC? And if you don't, tell me that, and that is okay if you do not know it. Okay, and while you guys answer that, I will answer this question here about do schools require you to fill out the FAFSA in order to be given merit aid? Um, some schools do, some schools do not. So that is a question in the process that you should just um, ask or confirm with the school. Uh, so, and the reason is some schools ask you to fill out the FAFSA um, knowing that you might not uh, get need-based aid, but they want to confirm that. They want to confirm that you don't get, they, they, you don't, um, won't qualify for need-based aid so that they know that you're going to fall into the bucket to get merit aid. Okay, so let's see. So um, I don't know my EFC yet. We have an idea. Don't know, don't know, don't know. We have a close idea. Don't know, but assuming it's high, I get that. <laughs> um, I understand um, you might not even want to know the number because all you know is you're not going to be able to afford anything. Um, yes, it's too much. I have one child in college, went through the pain last year with FAFSA. I hear you. <laughs> um, okay, I still recommend, even if you think it's going to be high, and it probably will be high, and in most cases, um, uh, nobody likes what their EFC number is, just still go run it. And, um, uh, and where I recommend you go run it, I actually don't have the, um, the URL right in front of me, but I would say just Google um, the words college, board EFC calculator. Uh, it's just, a, I, I like it. I think they do a nice job. Um, you'll get a, you know, nice, it's not gonna be 100% accurate, but it's gonna be, you know, um, really close to what probably your EFC will be. And here's the reason, the first two numbers, here's the reason why you wanna know number one and, and, and uh, um, number two. Number one is know your EFC. Number two is know your family budget those most likely are going to be two different numbers. They don't have to be the same. And I'll just give you the example. Let's say a family has an EFC of 40,000. That's actually a pretty high EFC. Um, or actually, let me, let's scrap that. Let me give you a different example. Let's say a family has an EFC of 80,000. At 80,000, you're not gonna probably, you're not gonna be uh, eligible for any need-based aid at any school. Um, but that's, so that's your EFC. So what that EFC tells you is kind of what branch that you're going to look at. And uh, so your EFC automatically says, I need to look at schools that only give merit scholarship because there is no chance from any school that I'm going to get need-based aid. Okay. So that's what that EFC told that family. The second thing is what's your family budget? Just because your EFC is $80,000, that does not mean that that's what your budget needs to be, right? You might and there was a great story of a woman shared this in the Paying for College 101 group, and I'm going to write it up because I just um, love the way she approached it. Her e she had an EFC of 80000 They knew that they weren't going to get any need-based aid, but her budget was 25000 I think it was twenty-five to 30000 because she had four kids, and so she needed to get them all through college, and so it didn't matter what the government thought she could pay for based on you know, her and her family's you know, income. She didn't have the savings um, and she didn't have the cash flow to pay eighty thousand uh, for each of her student or each of her uh, kids. So she determined that her budget, let's say, was that twenty five to thirty thousand dollar range, and that's how she approached the process. She looked for schools that where potentially she could pay sticker price and still be at that twenty five and thirty thousand dollar range, and then she looked for schools where um, after her student might get merit, the net cost of the school got her to that $25 or $30,000 range. But she could only approach the process because she had she knew her numbers. Um, she knew what to look for, at, at, at look for schools that were gonna offer merit and she knew what budget number she was hitting. So I highly encourage you, know your EFC for that purpose and then sit down with your um, spouse and then with your student and say, this is our budget and this is what we're going to um, work towards. Um, we are not, okay, responsible for 110% for Georgetown. Um, we are not paying that. Should we even let our son apply for any school in that price range that doesn't offer merit aid? Example, Columbia, Hopkins, Georgetown. That's a really good question. So this, Jennifer's asking, should I even let my student apply for a school that, um, that even if they got into, um, at, that we couldn't afford? 
you know, that's a family decision. Um, I, I mean, I could um, argue both sides, meaning sure, if, if it's important, if you think it's important that your student know that they could get in to Columbia, but could they handle the fact that if they got into Columbia, you're not gonna agree to send them because you can't afford them? Um, you know, that, that's what you have to decide. If you allow your student to apply to a school that you know that there's no way you're going to be able to afford it. And the reason why you know that is because it potentially, let's say the schools that um, Jennifer has listed, Columbia, Hopkins, Georgetown, those are all schools that only give need-based aid. If you know you're a family that's not going to get need-based aid from that, those schools, and that's going to be a family that has an EFC of 80000 or above, if you're okay letting your student apply there and then they get in and then they know ahead of time that they're not going to be able to go, I mean, that's like a family decision that you've got to you know, decide. Um, but just make sure that you have those discussions ahead of time so that you're not you know, at odds when they do get in and they're kind of pleading with you to send them there and then your only option is gonna be loans. Okay, so um, let me continue on the, on the search tips. Um, so you're gonna to need to decide, am I looking for need-based aid or merit? I really encourage people, and there were a lot of people on this call who have not started the process yet, start it with a wide net. And that means if you're looking for merit, if you're chasing merit, which is the phrase a lot of people use these days, then you really want to start by looking at schools, honestly, where your student is going to be in that top percentile, which is 75 percentile or above. And you can only look at that by their GPA and test score. And then of those schools where they are at the top of the of the academic percentile, which of those schools give merit scholarship? That should be, as we say, like the top of the funnel, that should be your wide net. And then start narrowing those schools down by location, if that's really important, by obviously major, if there's a, a you know, um, a, a, a particular major that your, your student is dead set on, um, uh, or by size, you know, but at least, you know, if you just search by their test score, their GPA, and what schools offer money, you know, like the biggest um, uh, uh, pot of schools that, 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 that your student could potentially get money for, and then you're narrowing it down from there. Um, number five, always include your state school, regardless of, um, you know, where else your student's going to apply. It's um, your state school most likely is going to be a, and a pretty good affordable option, you know, with you getting in-state tuition. So always include a state school on your student's college list. Um, always include what we call a, um, or try and include a, what we call a leverage school, or we um, sometimes referred to as a peer institution school. So, um, and you can actually Google this. You can say like Tulane peer institution school. And um, sometimes, colleges have the list of those schools actually on their website because they um, um, kind of, they have like, like packs of colleges um, that they look at, look towards each other to, to kind of compare themselves against. Um, uh, so that's a, an easy way to see what, co what other colleges, um, a particular college is looking towards as either similar to themselves. And the reason why we wanna look at a leverage school is if your student can get into, you know, um, a leverage school um, that might actually give more money than the school that they really want to give to get in that they really want to go to then next spring when all the decisions come through you can use that leverage school um, in the financial aid appeal process to say my student got in here they really want to go to your school but they got more money here you know can you match it okay um I'm going to um, okay, let's just go through these tips and then I'm going to switch over to College Insights to show you some of the data. Have your students' schools picked out and ranked by the middle of summer. So, um, you know, for the people who haven't started, you should get started because um, the reason why I say that you should have, a, a, it doesn't have to be a final list, but a really, really good list of where your student wants to apply to by the middle of summer is because then you're going to have to turn your attention to um, writing the essays and uh, filling out the common app. So um, this is, you know, if the more prepared you can be uh, and the more you and your student can get done before they go back to school in the fall, it will just make that, you know, uh, 
that fall of high school senior year, just so much easier. It's going to be crazy anyhow. Um, but so again, the more you can get done, particularly in July and August, the better for you and your student. Um, the other reason about knowing what schools that you potentially, your student might potentially be interested in early on is you're going to want to, to some extent, strategize. Maybe, big maybe, um, there might be a school that in that list that that your your student and you you're willing to let them apply early decision to, um, and if they don't apply early decision, you want to know every school that's on your student's list um, if they have an early action option, and you want your student to apply early action. Um, it's just a no brainer. They um, get the applications in early. You will get a they will get a decision earlier, and um, um, it's just the wise and easy thing to take advantage of. Um, and in fact, I recommend that you should find at, um, at least one or two schools that do have early action, uh, because it's just a nice feeling for your student to know that they have gotten in someplace um, earlier in the process. And for that reason, you might actually also look for a school that has rolling admissions. And some the rolling some rolling admission schools start actually in August. A lot of them open up in September, September 15th. So again, the earlier you know which of these schools your student's gonna to apply to, the more prepared they can be and get their application in. But again, highly recommend that a student apply to um, at least um, one rolling admission and then um, one or two early action schools, if not more. Um, the other reason to understand early, you know, by midsummer of where your student's going to apply is if any of these schools have um, additional requirements, uh, that your student needs to do to apply to the honors program or that they might have additional applications for the merit scholarships that we talked about. Um, so, okay, number six, keep track of every dead, date and deadline. I, I think you're getting the idea that that's important. Oh, and number seven, hate to say this, but nag your student to check their emails or create an email address that you can both share. Again, that's like a parent issue, parental issue, how you want to handle that. But um these days, you know, um, students just are not email oriented. They don't check their email. Um, and the colleges are going to be communicating to your student. They're not going to be communicating to you that much. And the reason why, even at this stage, it's important to check those emails is um, they might be, the college might have sent your student um, a fee waiver. They might have um, sent them a invitation to apply to a scholarship. Um, there are things that the college are communicating to your student before they even apply. And, you know, a lot of it, I hate to say is might fall into the junk category, but it's worth opening up um, because um, there's been too many stories of a student missing the ability to apply for an application because they didn't open up the email. Okay, I am going to um, jump over and um, share my screen. Um, oops. Um, and show you what College Insights looks like. Uh, I think I have to reshare. Okay, if anybody can even in chat say, can you see the, the screen now that says College Insights? If I can just get one, yes. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, actually let me, go. so this is the login screen. Um, but if you've never come to college insights, um, this is what it will look like if you go and check it out and you can check it out. Um, and uh, for five schools, if you just want to see what it's about. So I encourage that. Okay. So here's where you'll come. And um, again, if you've never been to College Insights, you'll have the opportunity to create a free account. And, and in that free account, you can list five schools um, and see all the data for those five schools to get a sense of um, you know, how the tool works. Um, okay, so, but let me log in here. And I see there's a little discussion going on about early decision. And Fern's correct. Early decision is um, if your student gets in, they are um, you know, supposed to accept the offer and, and rescind all of their um, applications from any other school. Um, this concept of binding is, is a, um, you know, uh, an interesting one. I actually have a um, session uh, scheduled with um, Ron Lieber. He's a New York Times uh, journalist 
um, who has done a lot of research into early decision and kind of the legalities or the ethical issues around it. And so anyhow, um, I'm not gonna dive into it now, but we're gonna do a session in August with Ron and he's gonna share what he's um, learned. So watch watch for that in August and uh, this still gives you enough time to decide whether your student's gonna apply early decision or not. Okay, let me log in <laughs> to College Insights. And I'm going to show you some of the important data and I'm going to show you how you um, search. Okay, so let me just quickly <coughs> um, show you that these tabs on the top, you can jump around. Um, you can also scroll and you'll see everything. The tabs just kind of jump, jump you to um, that section of the table. So, um, you know, academic stats uh, shows you the average high school GPA, whether or not the SAT is required. In most cases, you know, you'll see tests optional, but there's still a few schools that are um, test required. And as you know, some schools are shifting back, like MIT was a big announcement. Um, we have average SAT, average ACT, and also we have 75th percentile. This is an important column because um, this is, you're, you're going to be able to filter by what schools, um, what schools, your students' stats put them in the 75th percentile, and that's a really good indication of that they have a higher, definitely a, a good chance of being admitted, and they have a higher chance of being offered merit scholarship money from that school. Um, we have deadlines, we have admission rates broken out um, by early decision, early action, um, and then um, another really important column here is what percent of the class is filled early decision. So for a lot of the more elite schools, uh, I'd say those schools that have admissions rates there in 20% or lower, um, they do rely heavily on early decision. Um, there is a little bit of a you know advantage from an admission rate standpoint to apply early decision. Um, but the other thing that happens is that they are filling their a, a bulk of their seats early decision. So for example, and this is just what's on the screen, um, American, right? Uh, it, they they fill their so think about early decision is they give the offer and then the student basically all, they all it's 100 percent acceptance so um they are filling those um seats they're filling 50 percent 51 percent of their freshman class um through the early decision process so uh it just what that means is if your student doesn't apply early decision and they apply regular decision they can still apply it's just that that the um, admission rate becomes that much lower. Uh, and it just, it, it is harder to get in regular decision um, for certain schools. Wow, I didn't even realize this. I'm looking at Bates. I actually, now I, I did, somebody did mention this to me before. This is how much they rely on early decision. They are filling their class, 80% of their class, they are filling early decision. That, so if you're a student applying regular decision, you just have really slim chances of getting into Bates. But again, these are the more um, selective schools. Okay, let me um, jump ahead. Uh, merit scholarships. Oops. Yep. Um, these columns are really important for the people chasing merit. Um, and we're going to go quickly and, and filter, um, do a search so you can see um, how you the search results come up, but um, the columns that are important to look at here are the average merit dollar amount that the college offers, and then what percent of freshmen who don't have any need-based, um, that aren't going to receive any need, um, what percentage of those students are being offered merit. So, um, you know, here's an example, Clark University, it's just on the screen. This is the way I would read these numbers. The first column says that to me, 40% of the freshmen who are attending Clark um, um, do not have any financial need. Doesn't mean that they got merit, it just means that they had no financial need. Then the next column, 87% of the students that didn't have financial need got some sort of merit scholarship offer from Clark. And then on average, that merit scholarship offer was around $20,000. Um, so, that's the way you read the information. The other two columns here are, and I'm not gonna click because I don't wanna take it off, off the screen, but I mentioned we have a direct link to the page on the, on the college's website where they talk about their merit scholarships. Um, so this is just a shortcut for you to go directly to the, the college's website. And the, the other column here is if 
and the, um, a college is offering a full tuition or a full ride scholarship, we also have a link to information on the college's website um, for those types of scholarships. Okay, I'm gonna jump back. The last thing I'm gonna show you actually is um, this column that says crowdsourced offers. So for the past three years, we have been collecting um, offers from people in our community. When their student is accepted, they then share their, that information and, um, and we compile it. So we have an idea of um, all the other data that I showed you is the data that the colleges report, but we wanted to know what actually happens. So like what are the real offers that students are getting? And that's what this information here is. So you can see we have it for the past three years, three years ago, it was our first year, so it's a little light, but um, this past year, 47 people shared their crowds, their information about what they were offered from American University. And you can um, quickly kind of, um, what I, how I use this is, um, again, here's another reason why it's important to know your EFC, is you wanna go to the offers where, or that that student has a similar EFC to, to your family. And so let's say, you know, that family that had the 80,000 EFC. So you would go here and look at the offers um, from families that had a 60,000 EFC and above. Look at the um, um, stats of those students, what states that they were from, when they applied, and the dollar amount that they were offered. Usually this dollar amount should kind of um, coincide with the average merit scholarship amount that's in that column. But you can see more stats um, around the students. This is not scientific. This is much more directional information because we don't have enough um, on each school to make you know, any statistical claims. But it's just interesting information that you can start to see actual results um, from families. Okay, so on the left-hand side, you can search by lists and you can make different lists of, of schools that you want. You can search if you have a particular um, list of schools that you want to see the data for. So I, I was putting in this list for somebody the other day. So, um, you know, if I wanted to just see the stats for these six schools, I would put in the, those schools and then, you know, the information comes up. Or what most people do um, is use this last section, which is the search by preferences. And if we go to this concept of starting and casting a wide net, um, I would go down to the section here that says academic scoring. I would actually not um, define or filter anything by location yet. And I would go down to academic scoring and I would pick maybe the range where, you know, um, and you, you have to pick two point range here um, of 30 to 32, let's say, of, of a, my student might have an ACT that's in that 30 to 32 range. And I wanna see the schools that um, a 30 to 32 uh, puts me or puts my student, sorry, at the um, 75th percentile or above. Um, and I hit search and let's, and so here are the results. Um, you can scroll through, but what I do, because if I'm a family looking for merit, I'm going to jump to the columns with merit scholarships. And I know now that all of these schools um, have, um, you know, uh, if I have a 30 to 32, that that's in their 75th percentile of, of the students that they um, accept. And now I'm going to sort the column. Uh, you can sort a few of these columns, but I, I'm going to sort which, which of these schools are giving the highest um, average uh, merit scholarship award. Um, so this is kind of interesting. So um, Trinity College um, offers a lot of a, a big dollar amount, but they're only giving it to 2% of students who don't have needs. So that's not realistic. But look at um, Clarkson University. They um, are giving out an average merit scholarship award, a award of 33,000, and they give it to 88% of the students who have merit. So that shows me if I had a student, you know, with that ACT range, um, you know, Clarkson may or may not be the school for them, but I know that if I really want a school that's going to offer merit scholarships, I could start there and I could now um, do like a deeper dive of research onto Clarkson to see if that's a school that my student might be interested in. I know at least that I would get merit scholarship money from them. Um, College of Worcester, that's also a, a pretty well-known one that gives a lot of nice merit scholarship. They give 
32,000 to 96% of the students that have um, merit. So now you can kind of see how you know what, um, what the next level of research you should do if you're trying to find those schools that, um, that you want your student to get merit scholarship from. Um, and then um, the, uh, the other thing to look at obviously are the costs. So what I would do is, and you can scroll back and forth, I just jumped, is um, look at what the cost of attendance is, you know, at a school, let's just say Worcester, the cost of attendance is 68,000. Let's say, let's just round it off because I, because we're going to update these numbers. Let's say it's 70,000, right? And then let me jump back. So, so the, the cost is 70,000, but they're giving um, merit scholarship averages of around 32,000. So now what my net is, is that school, um, is going to cost would cost me um, thirty eight thousand if my student could get in and get the merit scholarship. So that's the net number that I'm going to want to compare against my budget. So this is a school that potentially could cost me thirty eight thousand, even though their sticker price is seventy thousand. Um, so I know that this was rushed. Um, it's just after one o'clock, but hopefully this gives you a feel for what merit scholarships are, what you need to focus on, how you can start playing around with College Insights. Um, and I'm gonna scroll through and look at um, uh, some of the questions. So does your website have every university in the US? So yes, the, uh, basically we have um, a listing of about uh, a little over 1500 schools. It is, are, they are schools that um, have uh, an uh, so undergraduate size of 500 or more or larger. And they are schools that receive, um, you know, federal funding from the US, from the, from the government. So that, that's the um, criteria we use um, of, the, of the schools that are in this database. What if you're, what if your high school does not rank the students? And, and yeah, and then the next question, if your school does not weight GPAs, how do you determine how it will be weighted by a college? Such a, these are great questions. We just happened to have last night a session on um, GPAs and weighted versus unweighted and what the GPAs mean in the process. And let me just um, skip for one second. It's related to GPAs. The reason why I'm still, you know, from a research standpoint, focusing on and talking to you guys a lot about using ACT or SAT scores is not because I'm, you know, a test advocate. Uh, you know, I'm really not. I'm actually a data advocate. I like to have good data. And the reality is that colleges um, provide the best data around these these um, uh, topic uh, for uh, they they share a lot of good data with around SATs and ACTs. They don't share good data around GPAs. Um, they only share the average uh, GPA. And a lot of schools, if I if I look at how many schools share SAT ACT scores versus how many schools share um, GPA, is a lot fewer schools that share their GPA information relative to the schools that share SAT ACT information. So that's why I lean towards researching for with ACTs SATs. And if, and I understand that there are a lot of students out there who don't, um, aren't taking the SAT and ACT, and that's perfectly fine. And you don't have to, you know, take it these days and you can still apply to schools, test optional. But for, for searching purposes, I would um, convert your GPA to a range of what um, an ACT or SAT is that you might've gotten. Or if you took a test, ACT, SAT, maybe you can use that number. And um, again, the, uh, what I do, just Google um, ACT, uh, GPA to ACT conversion. And there's a, oops, I spelled the conversion word wrong, but there's a, a site that has a really nice table that kind of takes your student's GPA and says, you know, this is a potential um, ACT that they might've gotten. And then just do certain ranges. You know, I'm not saying you have to say, oh, my student got a 3.8. That means that they would have gotten a 33 on the ACT. We don't know. So, so maybe you look at the 30 to 33 range. Um, and then you can, once you've narrowed the schools down by the, G, the a, ACT, you can then scan the GPA column. Um, and you'll probably see there's a fair number of schools that don't um, have GPA, but um, that's, um, that's the situation with GPA and SAT. But going back to um, 
the GPA question. Um, what we learned last night was ironically, um, GPA is a little bit of a, even though, you know, it's a little bit of a made up number. Every school, right, calculates their GPA differently. Some colleges take the, co take the um, GPA number exactly from um, the school's transcript, whether or not it's weighted or unweighted. Other colleges um, uh, recalculate the GPA. There was like, eight or nine different scales that we looked at that different high schools uses. Some high school uses use letters, some use a seven point scale, some use a four point scale, some use a five point scale. And so it's really a mishmash. Um, I can't really give you great information about um, GPAs other than to say, use the GPA that your school um, is, is um, calculating for your student. If they are calculating an unweighted and a weighted one, I would, um, use both of them and see, you know, what type of results you get from a search standpoint. Um, the, most of the uh, GPA scores listed here are supposed to be unweighted. I say the word supposed to be is because um, the colleges self-report this information. We really don't have any way to um, check, you know, double check if they're telling us the right information. And um, again, what I learned last night myself is that even if a college says that they reported an unweighted GPA number um, in, in um, what we have, and actually, I didn't tell you that most of the information that we have comes from the government source, which is iPads, and then the other bulk of information comes from the common data set. But even if a college says that they gave unweighted GPA, we really don't have any way to confirm that. Um, but so use the best information you have. Take what you the number you have from the school, do your research, and then um, for the schools that your student is interested in, 100% go and ask the, the college reps that your student should ask this. It's good for them um, to get into the practice of. Ask, have them ask the school, what GPA number are you using? Are you looking at my weighted GPA or my unweighted GPA? And if are you recalculating any of the GPA information? Um, that's kind of uh, the best you can do. Um, and it will, you know, get you a little bit closer um, to how they are managing their process. Okay, so if a school does not, um, oh, yeah, here's the question. Is all the data in, in College Insights available in a school's common database, data, uh, data set? Uh, most of it is um, available in the school's common data set. Some of our information is also from IPEDS, which is the government source. And then the third is the crowdsourced information is our unique information. Um, that's uh, information that uh, we've compiled and nobody, uh, there's not another source for that. So um, I, yes, you guys can look at a school's common data set. You can Google the name of a school and its common data set but you can't do what I call the reverse lookup. So you would have to know what schools you want to look at to know which schools to Google for the common data set. You can't, there's no place where you can search in reverse and say, show me the schools that have this information on their common data set that fit the criteria that I want. That was one of the reasons why um, we put together College Insights. Yes, does the cost shown on this site include room and board amount? Yes, it is. The cost shown on this site is cost of attendance, and cost of attendance includes um, room and board and other um, expenses, identified expenses um, that can be included in cost of attendance, like books and travel. Um, do the SAT GPA requirements depend on the academic program within a university that a student applies to? A university may be well known for a certain programs than the others. As a follow-up, is it a dependency of merit aid on academic program? This is a great question from Krishna. Um, the information here is at the you know, university college level. It is not at the program specific level. You're gonna actually have a really hard time finding program specific information. Um, there is like a handful of schools that might give you admission rates, you know, for example, at their um, um, engineering school versus the overall school. Um, you can ask an admissions officer if they have that information, if they're willing to share it. Um, but you should also just know, know for school, for programs that are popular, particularly engineering, computer science, they are going to be harder to get into. So whatever the school um, admission rate is, 
or admit rate is at the overall level for that school, it is very likely that at the more popular, um, more um, rigorous um, majors, that the, the admission rate is going to be lower and it's gonna be harder to get into that program. So you can kind of like take that into account, um, you know, making up numbers. If a school's overall admission rate is 30%, it's likely that it could be that um, at the engineering school, it could be in the low 20s. Um, does, do you use the cumulative GPA or junior year searching when searching? You use the cumulative GPA. Um, you know, if your student is a senior now, then they'll have their GPA from uh, freshman, sophomore, and junior year. If your child is chasing merit, is it SAT or ACT that schools are looking at, not GPA, or do they look at both? There's a range. Um, some schools uh, are still looking at um, a test score combination with a GPA for merit scholarship. So a school could be test optional to admit you, but they, but for merit aid purposes, they might still be looking at the um, SAT or ACT along with the GPA. So again, another great question. And you know what, um, I'm going to make up a list of all the important questions that, that families should ask um, that uh, to get more of the information that we just can't compile because it changes so much school to school. But I would ask that question um, of a school that is test optional. Are you also test optional for um, giving out merit scholarships? And um, so, it, so some schools are truly test optional for admission and for um, merit scholarship. So if you don't have a test score, they will just look at your GPA and they will offer merit scholarships just on your GPA. Um, but it's most likely that they have um, experience and know that if a student has a certain GPA score, that even if they didn't take a test, they probably would have likely scored in a certain test range. And then even a test optional school, um, if you applied with your test score, they might be using your test score to um, um, also grant the merit scholarship. So the world of test optional has been good and not so good. You know, it has been good in that for some schools, it has opened the gates and allowed students who might not have felt comfortable applying to that school apply because they don't want to um, apply with their test score. It has been good because it has taken the pressure off of some students who don't want to take a test. They can not take a test and still feel like they can um, go through the admissions process and apply to schools. So that is great. The not so great side personally is that I feel like it's created a lot of confusion and a lot of uncertainty in the world of of college admissions. We now have all these different, like, you know, some school does it this way, another school does it this way. Some schools are test optional for being admitted, but they're not test optional for merit. Some schools, uh, you know, they don't really share with you what's their admission rate for the schools that, uh, the, for the students who um, sent in their tests versus the school students who didn't send in tests. So, you know, for all the good that it's done, it's also kind of done some not so good because of the confusion um, that, that it's created. And, and I think a lot of people would agree with that. Is it, is it required to declare a major when applying? Um, it depends on the school. Some schools ask you for what you're, you know, the, ask the students what they're interested in majoring in. They may not be a commitment. They want to understand what the student is interested in. Some schools, they have sub schools, right? So they actually have the um, School of Arts and Science, the School of Engineering, the School of you know, Environmental Studies. And by definition, you are selecting the sub school to apply to. So in essence, you are um, um, you know, kind of telling them and deciding that you're gonna major in whatever that sub school offers. So for some, so that again, it varies school to school. Um, and for a school that is just asking, you know, um, what your student is interested in majoring in and you don't have to pick a particular sub school, it is also perfectly fine to say that they are undecided. There is nothing that I don't I think any school will look down on that. Um, you know, this I, this is the time when they should be exploring and it's um, if they truly do not have uh, something that they're interested in, it is fine to say that they are still undecided. So. It is 1.15, um, I'm gonna hop off um, just because I don't wanna hold people longer in the middle of the day. I really, really appreciate you coming on. Uh, hopefully that this was um, valuable information. Again, we'll send the recording. I'll um, send some of the inf information that I talked about um, 
um, in a follow-up email with, um, you know, getting your EFC and maybe and the tips that I recommend for building a college list. And all I can say is, please get started. <laughs> please start doing your research. Um, this is your best opportunity to make a huge impact on the results. And your opportunity is to research, understand the schools that your student is applying to, understand your own numbers, understand what budget, what EFC that you have, um, and then how do the, the schools that your student is applying to, how do they match you know, your numbers financially, and um, make sure that the list is balanced and so that you have options. Um, reach out with questions, and um, um, hopefully this is helpful. Okay, take care, everyone. Have a good weekend.